welcome to Actuality Podcast. I'm the host, Dominique Wu. Each week, we will have conversations with industry leaders to explore the unexpected connections and opportunities between diverse sectors and the world of spatial AI and XR. Today, our guests are Valentino Megal and Olivier Dada. Valentino is a skilled professional specializing in digital health as XR and biotechnology. He serves as the CEO of Softcare Studios, where he leads the development of immersive therapeutics for pain and anxiety management in healthcare. Valentino is a recognized TED, TEDx speaker, Forbes 30 under 30 uh, alum, and a regular contributor to discussions on how technology can enhance human well being. He actively collaborates with organizations worldwide to advance innovation in medical technology and digital health. Oliver Dada is based in Italy and is a, a, a physiotherapist and a programmer integrating rehab, uh, rehab, rehabilitation and healthcare with emerging uh, te technologies, particularly immersive technology, VR, MR. He works both as a, a, a psychotherapist and as a software development, focusing on programming and uh, accessibility uh, of the experience design. Cool, so thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Danny. Thank you. Hi, hi everyone. Cool. So right. tell us a little bit about what's your journey of being where you are today. Awesome. Um, I can start. Yeah, uh, sure. <laughs> um, I'm actually a researcher by training. So I really started my journey uh, with my PhD in neuropharmacology. So really during the traditional wet lab, so synthesizing drugs in the lab. But then, uh, almost 10 years ago, together with my colleagues, uh, they already knew before, uh, after some collaborations and uh, some no-profit work, decided to embrace a new, another kind of paradigm, actually, how to support patients on the other side, on the other side of the bench, without the synthesis of drugs, but actually providing some drug-free alternatives based on digital technologies. And that's when and how we started embracing also immersive tech virtual reality, first of all. It was the 2016, we, uh, we designed a concept in our mind and also some initial MVPs. And then after joining and attending a hackathon in Rome, uh, we have been awarded, selected as among the winners, and then everything started. But this is something that I'm going to tell you more when talking about the company that I represent, which is actually Software Studios. Leaving the digital <laughs> stage to Oliver. Hi there. Uh, so I'm basically a physiotherapist as my kind of, uh, well, half my job. Uh, and that means that would be in, you know, for Americans, probably physical therapist, uh, for Europeans, more physiotherapist, just so, that, so that's clear. Uh, so physical rehabilitation, um, I mainly focus on uh, neurological patients, but kind of not only because that also means elderly people with uh, deconditioning, which means um, general uh, pathology that tends to happen with age. So, you know, loss of movement, this type of stuff. And then you also have post-operative operative and other stuff. Um, now, uh, virtual reality comes into this because I'm also a programmer, so I decided to start integrating um, virtual reality to train patients. It started a bit like a kind of a game during the, uh, literally, a game during um, uh, COVID, and then it became more and more serious, and then just became like a thing I was doing the whole time. Uh, so basically, I, I started off developing uh, VR solutions for patients. And then I met Valentino and we started, you know, uh, developing stuff together. So that's kind of just to keep it brief. Uh, latest focus is on AI, which I'm studying, but I'm not, you know, qualified yet. So I won't probably be speaking so much about that. 
Wow, that's amazing. So, um, uh, Oliver, how how can you balance, you know, your medical like a uh, 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 physical therapy uh, versus like your development? What's your degree, and how can you get in both two? Those two are totally different world. How can you balance those? And you mentioned you are learning AI, right? AI, I would say that if your background is not computer science, it might take a long time just to know the basic and build on top of it. And how can you manage all the、mm -hmm. very heavy lifting knowledge? And those are totally different world. Uh, well, so physiotherapy is the the kind of degree I got first,、uh, and that is a in Italy is a, a bachelor's degree, right?、Um, and obviously the experience, which is something you you learn on the job, more than what I mean, no, not more than what you study, but a big part of it is the actual experience working in hospitals and with patients.、Um, as for the programming side, that's been something that I've kind of been developing for many years.、Uh, On my own, without a degree, and obviously that doesn't mean that I have a.、Uh, it's not like the same thing as having a degree in computer science, because my focus is very specific. So I think I would probably say that it's all about optimization and learning how you can really learn to use what you need and not get lost in trying to know everything and be a living Wikipedia. So it's about problem solving, and problem solving is probably at the center of clinical、uh, analysis. Like you know, in clinical analysis, you you haven't, especially in physiotherapy, you haven't got time to waste with doing all the possible things you could do with a patient. You literally need to find for that specific person what you can do to help them, and then you go directly to the solution、uh, if you can. You can't always you know find a solution, but you do whatever you can, and you have a limited time. Same thing when you focus on learning many things, which is kind of a bit of a thing of mine.、Uh, I also have a certification as a sound engineer. And I, I, you know, I've often before being a physiotherapist, I was a kind of a musician and a voiceover、um, person. So、um, it's kind of a, a little bit of a character trait, I guess. <laughs> so one of the fears is that people will think,、uh, "Oh, but you do like five things. How can you possibly do them all well?"、Uh, well, I don't know. I think you can.、Uh, I think it's a matter of determination, knowing where to place your energy. You, you know, how to distribute your energies. Um, as for the AI, I'm not learning how to make AI. I'm trying to actually, I'm doing a, you know, a masters in、um, AI and biomedicine. So I'm trying to bridge the gap between the two worlds.、Oh. I already know because there's going to be a lot of programming in there in other languages that I haven't studied so far.、Uh, I'm basically a Uni Unity developer, so you know that's、oh. the the focus.、Um, so yeah, so that's it. <laughs> Wow, that's、uh, quite a lot of like a different experience. Just like、yeah. you said that,、um, yeah, I, I totally feel you about like a,、uh, we shouldn't be a walking encyclopedia or you know walking,、uh, um, I don't know bookshelf, right? We should、yeah. just、uh, apply all our knowledge. So that's why、uh, when I design, I, I'm currently designing、uh, designing a course is called coding for artists,、mm -hmm. and、uh, I was trying to. Because、um, according to like a I don't know like the learning objective, I need to hit a lot of different goals like a loop for、uh, if statement all those like a、uh, simple stuff. But、uh, I I just think that if student can jump into a project and they learn as they go, and if they are interested in doing something, and they can、uh, for example, oh I want to add an AI human, and they、mm -hmm. have to Google it and figure things out. And it not not necessarily fit all those like oh、uh, criteria, but they know how to Google online and grab the knowledge to solve the problem. I think this is like a the 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 world.、Um, yeah, I I think、um, what 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 for me.、Um, um, I I I totally feel you that we shouldn't just like memorize all the stuff, but we apply it. Yeah, that's yeah. my my thought, and it's amazing that you are. Um, amazing in different field, and your brain still、uh, function amazing. <laughs> so, but I guess if、good. you think about it, problem solving is one subject which you、mm. can apply to many different things. It's about you know learning how to approach problem solving. If you learn that, you can、mm. kind of learn everything. You just need to kind of take the time to learn what you need. I guess、uh, wow. that would kind of be my my kind of idea on that.、Um, 
Yeah, I think you can also, you know, apply this to education because I think right now uh, problem yeah. solving and uh, critical thinking are the big topics that um, as educator we need to teach instead of memorize everything. Because you have chat GPT or you have AI, it pretty much automate or tell you all the knowledge you need. So you don't really need to memorize, but you need to know how to solve the problem. That's I, I think, yeah, I think you are the... Um, uh, like high up there and you, you've you already got all the how, how to utilize all the knowledge and mm -hmm. um, mix together and make uh, uh, amazing stuff cool so um, can I ask you like what's the uh, digital health and pain management what uh, how can you uh, do like a um, for example like a digital health and how can you help just like a, a Valentino you mentioned that drug free what does that mean? Uh, do we really need to uh, take drugs? Because every time when we go to the doctor, we feel I, I feel like if I didn't take drugs, if I didn't take prescription, I feel like I'm wasting my time. So <laughs> is there any <laughs> like explanations of like a drug free or like a pain management? Well, this is um, a, a relevant question because of course we are not replacing all the kind of drugs because drugs of course are there fundamental also parts of therapies, um, but especially in the domain of pain management and stress management, we should start from one consideration, that pain is a very deeply subjective, we can say, feeling and condition. So it does not depend only on the intensity of the damage, the organic damage that someone is experiencing. It depends also on the subjective personal anxiety state. It depends on the context, the settings, the environment when the person is staying during the procedure, during the specific kind of medical condition. So uh, especially in our case, in the, in the case of our company, Software Studios, uh, we are using virtual reality as a tool to replace this part of drugs. So whenever there is a psychological component in a medical condition, it means that we can use a cognitive tool such as virtual reality to add, or we can say to introduce some degree of control on the settings and the subjective condition of a person so that we can minimize the original condition. In our case, the original condition that we want to minimize is the pain. Of course, it's also the stress, it's also anxiety, it's also fear of the medical conditions. But whenever we can expose patients, we can bring them beyond the walls of the hospital, we can actually minimize pain. So the pain does not disappear, of course, it's still there, but it's definitely lower to a degree that is under control also by the patients. And we should remember that based on how patients feel, they have a resulting behavior. And that kind of behavior is what normally uh, drugs are made of for to potentially manage patients. So physicians administer sedatives or they administer pain killers in order to calm down the patient so that they can complete the medical procedure. So if we can provide virtual reality, we can minimize those conditions. It's easier to manage patients and physicians can work also in a more efficient way. That's why we always say by developing virtual reality, we provide both a benefit and a value for patients and to physicians, or we can say nurses and the health practitioners. Yeah, and may I ask you, like, because as far as I know, if you want to practice uh, your VR game on um, patient, you need to pass through, in America, it's called FDA. So mm -hmm. is there any, like, a procedure? Because you couldn't, for example, if I develop a game, I couldn't just, like, go to hospital and ask a uh, patient to try it. You need to get through the series of... Um, uh, procedures to get approved and how can you do the user testing well uh, in our case <coughs> especially in the european ecosystem uh, we are also not free to develop a content and then deliver the content straight to, to the patients in the hospital we uh, we provide any kind of content under the supervision of physicians and under the supervision of the ethical committee the ethical committee represents the first layer of control and validation of our solution. So they check something, they ensure that that kind of solution is not disrupting the decisional process of physicians, is or not collecting relevant data about patients, is or not providing any kind of risk 
reach the patients. So they, of course, make some preliminary decisions and they allow us or any other kind of company to potentially bring that kind of solutions to patients. Uh, something that I want to highlight is our kind of solutions are not collecting data and they are not adding additional risk to patients. Uh, we train the physicians, we train the nurses. So it is not a device that fall under the strict definition of a medical device. Because of course, if you start collecting data, if you start increasing the level, the degree of risk, or if you start changing the decisional process, even predictive or informational of physicians, then of course you need to, we can say, uh, upgrade you know, the, the degree of validation. You should ask for a validation, a certification process, which is longer, which is of course uh, more complex. So it really depends on the what kind of value you provide and what kind of mix of value and risks that kind of solution provides to the to the final users. Wow. So may I ask you like uh um for uh this types of like a circle, what do, do you have any like a study case how mm -hmm. you uh find the problem and how you start come up with the idea? It's like a, for example, like I saw a lot of games, right? And those games it's like a, for kids. It feels like a, for kids. And I, I, um, I, I need to read the background to know, wow, there are so many theories behind these simple games. Do you have like, a, for example, you find a problem and you come up with a theory and end up to be a super easy game? Uh, do you have uh, kind of like a, tell us a bit about like a, uh, one of your uh, kind of successful sure. project? Yeah. Um, I, I really like your question because this is important. You mentioned the game design here. Mm. And I think the game designers are one of the most important roles today from a business point of view. Because for, for too many years, everybody was thinking that game designers are just the ones who design games. But they know how to, we can say, convert a specific mm -hmm. kind of protocol into a motivational process for the final users. And this is today useful in healthcare, of course. This is useful also in business, in the workforce. How many corporates are, in, are involving game designers to gamify the workplace? That's an amazing kind of skill sets to have today. So really, this is an invite to many game designers around the world to say, hey, you are definitely more impactful than just designing games, which is something amazing. But still, you can really be a professional in so many uh, fields today. So side to this, what's important in our case is to remember that we deal with patients. And patients are not, we can say, traditional users. They have many vulnerabilities. They have many sensory, cognitive, and physical vulnerability. So what's important in our case is, first of all, to get as much as closer as possible to, to patients, to understand what is their daily routine. And then on top of this understanding of patients, what they can do, what they cannot do, what physicians are doing and what they cannot do, then you can, of course, sit down, collect all the needs and design. We can say a game, we can say an experience in virtual reality, which is motivational, uh, respectful of the vulnerabilities of patients, able to ensure the safety of the medical procedure, but also able to provide distraction and value to the final users. <laughs> so it's a complex, uh, we can say mix of many kinds of knowledges. That's why uh, I'm so happy to, to collaborate, for example, with Oliver because he is exactly the person who understands these two kinds of words. On one side, he's working every day with, with patients and he knows how they live. On the other side, he's developing also content. So he knows how to bridge the two things. Uh, we talked about AI before. No? So in, in the age of AI, the outcome is really the result of the, the, our capability to ask relevant questions. And Oliver is able to ask two kinds of questions, how to optimize the content, but also how to create something that fits in the needs of the final users and patients. So that, that's something great. Uh, this is an example on how in this world you need a mix of competences and multidisciplinarity. Otherwise you are going to undervaluate or underrate specific kind of aspects you know, of the final um, life of patients. 
Wow, this is like a, a, a very important thing, just echoing what you said that we need to uh, understand, for example, like Oliver, both, both sides, so he can speak and he can emphasize both sides. Yeah. So yeah, do you have any like a game like a, a currently applied to patient and uh, uh, what's the yes, problem you like saw? Yes, about these cases. Yes, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Um, so we, we got it. our first project that we developed is called Tommy. And this is a project that we developed for pediatric patients. So between uh, seven and 12 years old, 14 years old is very borderline in this case. Um, so this is a gamified experience in virtual reality that of course uh, we use gaming because gaming is the language of, especially of children, not to, to cope with the challenges of stress and, and pain and, and fear. Um, the experience is provided, especially in the domain of pediatric oncology, for example, orthopedics, and also young patients undergoing medical treatments such as peak placement or vascular access placement. It's a library of content because there are many mini games that patients can experience while sitting in a hospital, while lying on a hospital bed, while undergoing chemotherapy, so long, uh, sometimes painful or discomfortable, we can say, experiences. But I want to cite one example, uh, the one that we started to explore in 2021. So patients, not necessarily from pediatric oncology, but young patients undergoing vascular access placement. So vascular access is an invasive procedure that generates a lot of discomfort. It's quite painful, and especially in uh, in, in younger in, in younger children, um, they make a lot of resistance. Of course, they start to cry, they start to 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 uh, you know uh, avoid the treatment. So, in the most of cases, this kind of patients needs to be totally sedated. Total sedation looks like something fast. Patients fall asleep, and that's it. You can complete the procedure, and that's complete. But that's not the end of the story because total sedation comes with downsides. It comes with side effects that, you know, can bring patients back to the hospital and can generate a lot of problems. It comes with costs. It costs to sedate patients. It costs to occupy the surgery room, to involve the anesthesiologist. And it also adds extra time at the end of the story to wake up the patients. So you see, it's not so simple as it is uh, described. So what we are doing, is providing virtual reality and one of the contents of Tommy to patients during the vascular access so they can continue to play without relying on total sedation. Of course, there is a local sedation that is made, of course, to avoid the, the organic pain. We can say the, the contact pain. But then they don't need the total sedation. They're just playing, uh, ensuring the safety of the medical procedure. They complete the procedure. They just... Uh, wear off the headsets and they are ready to come back to their daily life. So they are not falling asleep, no problems, no side effects. And it's a great advantage also for the management from the health practitioners. We are using this with pediatrics. We are now using this also with adult patients and elders, also during surgery, actually. Wow. So this is definitely like a help, like a children to kind of, um, I would say, uh, manage, manage their pain, right? Um, before, long time ago, a few years ago, I was thinking about creating like a, some uh, interesting, like a small games to distract uh, kids doing chemotherapy. That is kind of like something, I don't know who, who mentioned it and I was start developing it. But the thing about it is that, for example, like uh, I, I uh, in my team, we had a nurse. So yeah. uh, she mentioned that, oh, you know, sometimes for chemotherapy, you only have one hand because the other hand is under, you know, like a, doing <laughs> some some painful stuff. So um, needs to be like a one hand experience, right? And uh, so uh, it, it also reminds me of like a lot of restrictions and also safety, right? You don't want the game to be too violent exactly. because, you know, uh, it might kind of like hit something, but you don't want things to be, Oh, there, there, there are, I would say there will be a lot of like interesting, like limitations that we didn't even thought of. For example, like uh, maybe patient will always lie on the bed, right? So maybe there's like a, I don't know, pillow, like that types yeah. of game, uh, putting on the ceiling might be more, yes, uh, yeah. Exactly. This is uh, this is nice. Pillow, it's a, it's a great example. Yeah. 
uh, but, but actually the, the possibility for patients to, to play the game while totally lying on the bed, this is something that we introduced almost two years ago. Uh, it was very uh, niche in, the, in that moment. Now Pilo is, is, uh, is online. Now even actually Meta no, uh, introduced this kind of feature so that people can experience content while lying. Mm -hmm. But this is something that we needed to introduce because in many cases, the medical procedures are made on patients that are lying. So it's important for them to still be engaged in virtual reality, but ensuring the safety of the medical procedure and ensuring that health practitioners can complete the procedure exactly as they do every day. Wow. Yeah. So um, um, next question will be um, what types of like uh, emotion relief, for example, pain management and emotion. I mean, you have a pain first and later on you feel emotion or your emotion will cause your pain. How can you kind of do both? Because pain management, maybe you distract them and they forget about their pain. It's still there, but they just not notice. And how like those two can be kind of like a being lead in a positive way. Like how can game really helps? Like, do you have any, for example, like game mechanics or your findings, um, maybe shooting game or something or for uh, boys or girls? Because as far as I know, girls like to build things, like to build relationship, like to facilitate like a role, role play. But for boys, they like this, they, they destruct. For example, like I want to destroy, I want to kill, I want to kind of like a bump something and destroy something. So yeah, how, how can you like, for example, like a uh, like uh, different gender or different age, do you have any findings of uh, what types of uh, kids or more like a younger generation, uh, what, what types of games can really help them? Well, from your question results, something that is fundamental to our work, there is no one standard patients out there. Everybody's unique, which is great, but it's also extremely challenging for companies like uh, like ours, for all of you to, to, to create a content for them. So something that you see in many companies working in the field, they never create one content, they create libraries of content. Because at the end of the story, health practitioners need to be able to select the right content to the right patients. They need to do a little bit of evaluation. Of course, uh, when developing Tommy, for example, uh, with our game designer, Camilla, uh, we decided to create a, a scenario that is, we can say, gender neutral. So that is, you know, uh, at the same time, suitable for uh, girls and boys, but you know, it's uh, you're going to welcome all of them, not in the same scenario. But what you can do is delivering content that are specifically good for children, then good for young adults, for teenagers, then good for adults, so you need to create different kind of contents. Um, there is also another kind of variability, like for example, of course, there are children or patients, I, I'm just including also adults and elders, okay, in this, in this kind of scenario, but there are some patients who want more um, dynamic interactions. So you need to include like shooters, something like that. And behind, behind the shooters, behind the curtain of the shooters, there is the sensory motor distraction which is an extremely good mechanic to, for pain management, which is that you're exposing patients to a sensory stimulation and you are requiring a timely uh, interactive motor reaction. And that really um, loads our cognitive loads and you can dedicate a little bit less attention to pain and more on that virtual world. Um, other patients want something more mindfulness-like. So you need to include content that is more relaxing. But also, let me add another difference. When we are managing pain, uh, 70, 80% of them, they are so-called uh, blunters. So people who normally cope with pain, trying to avoid the pain. I don't know, how about you? But I'm normally looking away from the needle. I don't like needles. So I'm a blunter. And virtual reality will allow me to look far, far beyond no? and, and away from the needle. But there are some children or some adults who wants to look at a needle. Wow. So you provide to them the medical procedure and they are in virtual reality. They say, oh, that's amazing, but please, I want to see the entire procedure. So they are the so-called monitors. And you should include also in this equation that some patients don't want to be totally distracted. For example, 
the introduction recently of mixed reality. Mm -hmm. So the capability of having the pass through and see through the headsets while still being a little bit more distracted could be an amazing tool to potentially support also monitors. So you see many variables out there. No one standard solution. You need a lot of customization. We did a challenge for a company like ours. Yeah, because just like you said that um, the older generation might like it more mindful, relaxing. Because yeah, I, I totally agree. Because before I like uh, a lot of action stuff, but now I, I, I like something that is relaxing, just like meditate. And also, just like you said, some people like to look at the needle. Some people don't like. Uh, I can tell you when I was in high school, um, the first time joining the blood, I faint. I just like it just like a, a blackout. And the, the next time when I wake up, I was uh, lying on the hospital and people said that I look at the needle too much to stress and I just lose my conscious. So <laughs> it definitely is like a, the person who doesn't like to look at but needles. You're a blind, you're a yeah, blind. yeah, <laughs> right, right. So, so yeah, so um, uh, mixed reality might be good for people who just like, Oh, I want to see what types of stuff apply to me, right? And also patient education. For example, like during diagnosis, do you see that um, how a uh, uh, doctor explain to the patient if there's any, I don't know, generative AI or something visualized for patient to understand what, what's going on? What, what's the, uh, sir, um, you know, what's the, any procedure applied to my body uh, for more like a, maybe adults or anything um, that, that, that might be also good too, yeah. But I think it's, uh, for example, Oliver, mm, I don't know what's your perspective, but you're working also with patients directly also in the domain of rehabilitation. And probably when patients are wearing the headsets, they sometimes need to see the practitioner outside. What do you think yeah. about this? Yeah, absolutely. Um... One of the problems in physiotherapy, for example, is the fact that if you don't have like mixed reality is a godsend now, because if you have a patient who has something like Parkinson's or even just has some uh, balance problem, then you really need them to to be able to see around them. It's easier for them to be able to connect with the, the you know, the clinician. It makes it maybe a little bit less scary or disorienting for people who are trying the first time. But to be honest, that's never really been a problem. Like the immersion is really welcome in most patients, even elderly patients. Uh, I think mainly it's the safety issue for me. And also being able to, um, you know, see your limbs or, for example, mix, like apply textures to 3D objects. So if I've got like, I don't know, this thing here, I can have something showing on it and then I can have this interacting with something that is going to remain in a space uh, i don't know it's just opens up so many different um uh possibilities so the you know the mixed reality thing is is really super and we haven't even got into you know education and training and, and all the things we've done together um so yeah absolutely wow so yeah so just like you said that for mixed reality people uh, might want to see the surroundings to feel more safe and also want to see their limbs and also, uh, if things can be more like a realism, right, then that would be great. Uh, for example, do you see like a, what types of headset uh, you guys apply? For example, like a Quest 2, Quest 3, or uh, Vision Pro? Because uh, when Vision Pro just came out, a lot of people said that, oh, this is for healthcare. This is for uh, surgeon. But uh, what, um, um, you guys are in the field. What, what do you see those different headsets uh, and what's currently uh, wild uh, applied in uh, the hospital or in actual practice? I, I can add just some second that we are actually using the, the meta devices right now, like, like the MetaQuest 3, for example. And especially when it comes for the patients, uh, so, you know, larger scale, bigger numbers, uh, dailies, MetaQuest 3 is absolutely a, a good choice, uh, providing good quality of the content and interaction and usability. Uh, when you say uh, Apple Vision Pro for surgeons, probably there is a, a, a part of the real story there in the sense that when you want to, to deal with higher training or very precise training, especially for surgeons, when you need to uh, simulate precisely how you intervene in the in the specific body of, of the patients. Probably 
um, the Apple Vision Pro can provide an interesting quality at the end of the story. Um, so it's it's really depend on the settings. What do you think, of Oliver? Uh, my main beef, uh, from a very technical point of view, with um, with Apple Vision Pro would be mm -hmm. that it appears that the tracking, the hand tracking, is very slow. Uh, compared to, well, very slow, slower than MetaQuest. So if for uh, physiotherapy, it would be completely out of the question. And I'm not sure about the FOV of the tracking I'm talking about, not the FOV of the, you know, the visual FOV. So that would be one issue. And probably, you know, the limitation that you can't have controllers. You might not want them, but, you know, you can't have them. But definitely, I would imagine the visual quality would and the pass-through would be better. So for some things that require mixed reality, maybe for something... You know, for certain applications, it will be better. Um, but in the end, it's also a price factor, I guess, right? Uh, so, yeah. 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 <laughs> Sorry. Just like you said that, um, uh, like the price and also um, the, the hand tracking. I find out uh, Vision Pro is very like, a, you, you need to have your own one. For example, like when I develop and I want the developer to take a look why this is not working. And the developer needs to do the recalibrate, uh, uh, recalculation for the eye, right? Yeah. And it takes yeah. so long and it's not, it's more for personalized. Exactly. Um, um, so if patient has one, then it's hard for this patient to share with another patient. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's another one. And the other one is that sometimes when I wear it, right? And it's sometimes it's moving around and the eye hand, will not be that precise and I couldn't even hit anything, right? Mm -hmm. And also no controller, for example, like uh, um, when um, I, I recently I'm like developing, uh, putting uh, a, a person or a player into the literature world. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to use the hand tracking, but the thing about in VR is like, how can you teleport yourself or um, uh, locomotion, right? And I know that uh, Meta SDK 66, you can use like this type of weird, like a hand, a uh, finger and doing the another way and rotate and to do the direction, but it's just not intuitive. And sometimes, you know, finger uh, for the tracking, uh, finger, everybody's skin color, hand size and knuckles. And for example, if, if, if you said that fist, uh, some people's, um, um, uh, their thumb will tackle down. Some people will stick out. So yeah. there are a million ways of doing things. So for example, thumbs up is uh, 90 degrees thumbs up, but uh, 45 degree is this thumbs up. So yeah, so there are a lot of like uh, different things. And sometimes you see like uh, for the camera, if on the back of your hand, it couldn't detect. So it doesn't really know what your hand really mm. uh, trying to do and it's keep moving, right? So yeah, and especially if the light is a little dim, it's very hard for the, the the thing to detect. So do you prefer more like controller or do you prefer more hand? Or yeah, like a, a, what, what, what do you think? Oliver, what do you uh, think? I think this depends very much on what you're doing. Uh, mm -hmm. Because if we were talking about a research project where the this is going to be, I don't know, just researchers using it, then I would probably go with a controller. It's more reliable, you know, it's going to, and you're expecting people to not have any kind of disability when they're using it, right? Mm -hmm. So you would be fine with a classic UI, uh, classic in the sense with, you know, maybe with a pointer or something. On the other hand, if you have people with who, I don't know, let's imagine somebody who has uh, spasticity in the hand, which means they're not going to be able to open their hand or move their hand properly, mm -hmm. then you need the whole UI, which has kind of been my focus for a long time now, uh, to to consider all these aspects. So you need a UI that is not going to require any kind of gestures in the hand, controller or no controller. And the only way you can do that is with a physical 3D UI where you poke the buttons with your whole limb, right? Oh. So you have big buttons and you poke it like this. And where the slide is, you put your hand in and you move it up and down. For me, that's the only way. Obviously, if you can't do that, then you have vocal control and you, you know, with stroke patients, sometimes they can't speak either. So there's going to be a type of patient which cannot effectively use uh, VR if they can't do any of these things. But usually you expect them to have one one limb that's working well enough, probably both, uh, to at least um, access the UI in this way. So then you have to consider, you know, 
the height of the UI, it should kind of automatically fluctuate to the right height. So you have lots of, of stuff like this to to think about. Uh, but as for, you know, hand tracking and, or controllers, I think the best thing is, you know, have the option for both uh, and just have it automatic, automatically integrated so you can use either hand tracking or controllers or this kind of, what do you want to call it, physical 3D UI or external control from a tablet so that the person who is mm. directing so you really want to have all this uh available you want to have gaze control you basically want the whole packet if you want you know you want to be able to have a, a framework to kind of to have all these things and be able to implement them quickly for any project uh that's kind of what i've personally been working towards um you know in my own projects but also with valentina it's kind of a the thing <laughs> No, I want just to add that, for example, we worked also with uh, elder patients um, simulating, for example, the MRI. Uh, that was an educational content. So elder patients that were prescribed with the MRI, they had the opportunity to experience the entire process of the MRI in first person. And of course, a controller, when it comes for pain management, a controller is an amazing tool because the fact that you are testing reality in VR with a controller with those haptics and you have in return even a small vibration is a way to validate that that reality is somehow yeah, real absolutely. and it's convincing. But for elder patients, a controller is always a matter of translation. What do I need to do to have that kind of reaction in the virtual world? And that, uh, that translation is not a native for people who are not digitally native. So you need to explain them. Someone catches immediately. Someone is not getting it immediately. So we use eye control, so the gaze, basically, mm -hmm. to select the different kind of buttons in to, to navigate the scenario, the scenario, to navigate the, the menu. Uh, that was more intuitive for them. So just avoid the complexity and just provide gaze control. It really depends. Uh, you, Dominic, said something important. Uh, all the people just using terms in different ways. We often talk about hand tracking, eye tracking, like a natural UX. You suddenly have the possibility to use the natural movements of your daily life. But the problem is that algorithms today try to reduce this naturality not to a standard that is still tricky mm -hmm. because everybody moves legitimately in a different way. Yeah. So the question in this case is, is our goal to reduce everybody to move in the same way or to develop algorithms that are able to understand the complexity and variability of human movements? That is a big challenge. Yeah, because I mean, right now I find out that, for example, like uh, I have a student doing thumbs up and thumbs up to, to toggle things. And yeah. when he was doing something like a um, almost a hundred, like a, in the middle, then uh, nothing moves. And he said that, oh, I'm doing some thumb, some thumb. But, you know, sometimes when we are in different angle, right, and it will toggle different things, but the, the computer, the, the uh, kind of cameras, sometimes different angles or the lighting, the shade, uh, it will kind of like a, a effect, affect um, all the final decision and which will be very jarring. If we didn't, uh, put all the different scenarios uh, inside our game. Um, sometimes uh, patient just like, oh, I, I, I make it some stone, but why things is not working? So yeah, so I find out that uh, for him tracking, we still have a long time to kind of yeah. map, especially for example, like OpenXR to MetaQuest, mm -hmm. the controller mapping and all the controller mapping to the hand mapping. Mm -hmm. I find out there are a lot of gaps just to, just to, to, to figure it out, how can we kind of leverage from controller to hand? Yeah, so yeah. Th th those are uh, like, uh, my background is UX design. So those, like, I want to create the most amazing like uh, experience, but at the beginning, I go back to the controller just because it's easy and it's, <laughs> it's for sure, because it's, for example, you press the button is uh, either yes or no, right? And the, the value is zero to one. So it's much easier to control the feedback. Cool. So um, the next question, uh, educational and training uh, initiatives. So uh, what do you uh, see that um, the educational and training programs especially uh, impact 
uh, for both uh, both uh, healthcare professionals and the patients. Yeah, um, I can start on this. I'm, I'll be super happy also to to continue the discussion with uh, with Oliver because actually this is something that we are uh, really focusing right now. Um, well, first, there is no better way to learn something than learning it by doing in first person. And of course, this is not always possible because to learn by doing in first person, you need logistics, you need the space, you need some people that dedicate the time as a mentor or as a tutor, and you need to commute, you need to travel many times, you need the, the time. So especially for health practitioners, for example, uh, that have limited seats during the training sessions, many potential nurses, many potential physicians, but only 10 places to train. And if you train, you can only train once or twice. So you can even, you don't have the possibility to repeat enough times to acquire the confidence to reduce the resulting error rate, which is the final goal of the training. Well, virtual reality is an amazing tool and mixed reality, you can say XR in general, is an amazing tool to delocalize the learning by doing. So you can actually simulate any kind of settings you can collect data, which is something amazing because you can have a sort of a Fitbit of your training journey. Um, and you can pra practice in first person, wherever you are, so you can learn by doing, but without being in the dedicated space. So you can save time, cost, and of course, a lot of energies, and you can access talents wherever the talent is in, uh, in the world. So we started recently to really focus on the training of practitioners because we are working with a network of hospitals uh, that say, well, we have a challenge. We Our nurses practice once a, a new treatment, and then they need to wait for another year. And in the meantime of this year, they're forgetting the things. So how can we reinforce their skills without the need you know, to manage physically all of this stuff? And this is something that we started to work together with Oliver uh, some time ago, also on our um, social media channels, we published some some demos that we are experimenting with, and especially mixed reality. Uh, it's an amazing tool for that. Oliver, what do you think? Yeah, so uh, where can we start with this? So I guess one thing would be giving some, you know, I guess we could start with what we did. Uh, we did, uh, you know, we made some, uh, we've been experimenting with it in particular for the purpose of kind of demonstrating. We made a, a tech demo uh, where we were basically running uh, the player, so to speak, but it's not the player. It would be the person, you know, learning the, the nurse in this case um, through a series of steps. So you're going to have instructions and you're going to see the room you're in. You're going to have a bed, right? And the patient is going to automatically appear on the bed. So the bed is real. The patient is a virtual patient. And uh, you're going to check, you know, the patient's medical history uh, and then follow the procedure. So, you know, assess the vital parameters through a screen, which you turn on. And then in the end, you have to place a respiratory mask on a patient, right? So this is a very simple um, procedure, but it kind of demonstrates the fact that you can... Um, you know, what's difficult to remember sometimes is what order you do things in when you have to, especially when you're learning protocols. And uh, more than physiotherapists, in fact, uh, nurses have a lot of protocols to follow because it's a, a type of uh, discipline where um, standardization is probably much more important than in physiotherapy, for example. So for nurses, they really need uh, strict and severe protocols that are tried and tested because they're dealing with very... Uh, delicate situations and vital parameters. So because of that, uh, they really need to learn the protocols uh, firmly in place and the order of things. And this is so much easier to learn when you've actually done it. Uh, it's not something you learn so easily when you're just reading a sheet, you know, what was I supposed to do first, this or that? But, you know, when we move, we remember our movements, we remember we have all the sensors working. So uh, I'm doing this, I remember the color of the uh, you know, the um, notebook or whatever it was I was touching, then I remember that I moved over there and that was where the screen was. All this is all uh, neurological afferents that we register in our brain and it improves uh, memorization um, as well as the obvious advantage of being able to train off-site, uh, as Valentino mentioned. So this was our kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, demo to, to show this. 
Uh, there are so many different areas where you can do this. Uh, you know, one, you could list them out. It could even be used for training patients in self-care um, procedures. So a very obvious example for us as physiotherapists would be uh, instructing patients how to deal with their prosthetic arm or with their braces. So the, you know, you have to remember to clean your brace, you know, take it off, clean it, put it back on. The prosthetic limb needs some kind of attention. So again, this is something easy because you could have the, the brace appear on the patient and then, you know, tell them, right, it, it can recognize your brace and then you, you know, you take it off and everything. So super useful for a number of things. Um, and the, yeah, mixed reality is really central to this, I would say, uh, not necessarily, you could also do it in, in just a completely immersive environment, but I would say, uh, mixed becomes fundamental because you can do this at work and you can see what's going on around you, especially and interact with the objects and the tools. Uh, if we mix this in with AI in the future, it's going to be crazy, but, um, <laughs> for now, even just the way it is, it's pretty powerful. And it's very eye striking as well. I find that um, colleagues who have seen this, they're like, wow, what are you doing? <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it looks very, uh, very sort of uh, futuristic in a way when you present it to people. Yeah. And may I ask you, you mentioned the protocols for, for example, nurse and uh, uh, doctors to follow. Also, um, there's another, uh, the other idea, which is more training critical thinking, for example. Um, there are a lot of different situations happens to here. And if, uh, what should doctor or nurse do if the nurse was doing different things, right? Uh, it's like um, when nurse throwing into a very chaotic uh, situation and everything happens at once, right? And which need to do like, for example, priority. And uh, the, the, the thing about making more like a critical thinking types of like a open sand types of game, for example, like if I didn't do this thing within a certain amount of minutes, the patient will die. But uh, the, the nurse probably did the thing that is the last priority. And later on back, oh, game over because the, the patient pass away just because you didn't prioritize this person's needs. So according to this and uh, uh, right now, uh, the, 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 the thing that I, I interviewed previous doctors, they mentioned that every time, for example, like it's very hard to train AI for the doctor uh, workflow, just because when you say a noun or any uh, kind of like a procedure, every doctor, every nurse has different way of doing things. So it's very hard to standardize. For example, apple, we all know what's apple. We all know what's pineapple. But for example, if... If you mention, for example, sepsis, there might be some types of standards that your standard is different than my or different states or different countries that has different standard. So how do you standardize it? Or do you think a training more like a standardized is important or training more like a critical thinking, like a swirl nurse into a chaotic room and everything happened. And as a developer, we code like, oh, this is like within 10 seconds or this is within one minute, something needs to be triggered. Mm. Uh, and if not, then gain over and tell the student you have to do something. Like what types of uh, things you think is really important for, for a nurse or doctor to learn? That's really super interesting, I think, as a question, <laughs> because it makes me think of two things. Uh, one is the fact that, you know, the step we were facing with the, the training demo is... A protocol so protocols exist before we even consider the com you know the complex situation which is outside mm -hmm. of of uh the usual thing happening but clearly what you've underlined is that both in the experience of a an, you know you have um unexpected things happening mm -hmm. and so i guess that's something you could include uh in in a in a training program also in in vr or mr so you could probably do that you'd probably need to think about it you know you'd probably need to really design the whole thing really thinking about all the things that could happen and you still would never be able to cover them all but you could probably at least put enough of those variables in that the person doesn't quite know what to expect so they kind of learn to kind of act uh coldly 
but you know with unexpected things happening and that would be an excellent training but you've also underlined something that also valentino i think sort of touched upon he, he was talking about um um in particular about uh you know do you want to standardize movements no because everybody's different right so i think it's something that's a big problem in general in in clinical you know the clinical world and the, the academic research world is the tension between the standardization and protocols and this is more true probably in my field than in in you know uh medicine just normal medicine but uh and the other side which is um the biopsychosocial model which is the idea that you have to be patient centered and you have to be flexible and you know adapt the treatment to the single person mm -hmm. so this is something to give you an example right uh if it's uh if we're talking about you know i don't know genetics research or pharmacology that's going to be much more defined i think valentino can confirm it's easier to establish that something is going to work statistically in that way you may have exceptions but you can kind of uh, reach some kind of truth right some overall truths in this uh, in everything to do with rehabilitation, this is not so true because um, the person will have a different presentation of the, the illness, the pathology. They will have a slightly different anatomy. They'll have a different psychology. They'll have a different uh, way of uh, moving. Uh, they might not like the therapist and somebody else might like the therapist. So you're going to have all these additional layers. Uh, and the problem with that is that you can't really standardize rehab protocols not for us probably not for psychologists probably not for speech therapists and because of that uh, you can standardize some things but other things you need to be flexible and i think the 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 kind of um solution to that you know how do you do research on those type of things is going to come from ai in the end uh, because it's going to be able to analyze so many variables and possibly at that point when we go back to talking about xr uh, as Valentino said, it, it, it will get to the point where it will be able to think and recognize each person's different way of moving and, and you know, find uh, a meaning in these different variables that a human being couldn't possibly do just with statistic, you know, very crude statistic studies, which is basically what our research is uh, compared to what an AI could probably do in the future. Sorry, that was a bit of a long kind of uh, tangent I took, but I, I hope that was kind of, uh, that made some sense to you guys. Yeah. So basically you mentioned that something can be standardized. Something cannot be, for example, like, uh, uh, some, uh, certain, uh, procedures that can be standardized while something like a psychology or rehab rehabilitation, those probably needs or, um, uh, like some, some therapies, they might need to be very customized and uh, yeah, I mean I guess I mean that they can be in principle standardized but in practice it's always extremely complicated and, and it wow. never seems to work when you do it too much uh, in that way probably because we don't have the tools yet yeah. if yeah. we did have the tools then then maybe yes but we don't for now <laughs> um how, how do you yeah go ahead no yeah, I'd no, like to hear about, Valentino chime in on this because it's kind of something yeah, yeah. Valentino yeah just on one point that um well with the simulated training you can really predict all of the potential cases and especially when it comes for very niche exceptions that, that always happens uh they are not scalable from the product point of view so imagine that you really want to cover the unimaginable niche of situation you cannot predict or you cannot cover all of them with the content so what do you want to do with the simulated uh, training is really to allow clinicians or nurses to even do a lot of mistakes, repeat a lot of mistakes to really understand and acquire the confidence. But of course, some degree of experience will always be the result of the real world experience. So you want yeah. to just minimize the risks no? and just create many decisional process. But uh, you want to, uh, nurses to come up with the confidence so that they can also contain potential exceptions in the real world. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a tension that Oliver said. It's a tension between simulation and reality at the end, no? between what you can simulate and what the, the, the complexity of reality that sometimes it's even not included in AI because AI in a statistical model 
And if the statistical model does not include the niche exception, will not cover that exception mm -hmm. yeah. or in the, at the end, even in the predictions. So it's a, yeah, it's a trade-off. Yeah, I, I think what, what you mentioned is right. And also I saw a lot of like a training right now. Um, they integrate with AI assistant. For example, like a, in nurse training, uh, I saw one of the kind of like presentation online. They put a nurse that is ready to answer all your questions uh, when you were in the simulations. What do you see this type? So for example, like an AI assistant, uh, meta human or uh, whatever you like to call like an NPC non-player characters, uh, that types of um, virtual humans, uh, AI powered types of characters inside the training or inside the game? Well, in the case of the training, virtual humans are, uh, once again, a good potential tool to replace some standardized you know, or repetitive tasks that are normally uh, done by human mentors. But the problem is that when human mentors are required, they need to invest time, they need to invest presence, you need to dedicate specific time slots from people from whatever in the world. If you have a virtual human that can automate these parts, you can save a lot of time, a lot of costs, and a lot of um, efficiency, you can say. But not everything can be covered by virtual humans. This is just a way to bridge the gap. This is just a way to save the cost so that you can have extra cost, extra time that you can dedicate for the exceptions or to have a more critical approach to everything. Normally, because of the amount of work that we should do, there is no time, no money to really dedicate to all of the questions. No, because you need to dedicate a lot of time. With all of this automation, smart automation, you can save the time that you can dedicate for the the discussion that matters at the end of the story. Mm -hmm. So virtual humans are definitely very interesting, a very interesting perspective because it's different to talk with AI, just a voice, yeah. or to see the AI embodied AI that have a body, that have a voice, that have a behavior. So the kind of communication is more realistic mm -hmm. and even your acquisition of skills is more realistic. Like it's, it's something that is mapped by your brain like more meaningful. Mm helps to, to, to store into your memory that kind of information. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so for like an AI-powered human or AI-powered assistant, uh, in education, we talked a lot. For example, like a lot of people said that, oh, they have like an AI tutor, right? And for example, Khan Academy, they have like a Kamiko. Uh, you can ask the Kamiko, uh, the chatbot, any questions you have during the class. So yeah, so, and I can see like in different um, areas, now a lot of like a chatbot tailors to different uh, specific knowledge and you feed on the more like a, uh, I would say kind of like a LLM, but the local one or the small one that yeah, you sure. feed your customized data, that might be a, 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 another way of training. You know, just let me add one point because I read an article, an interesting article these days about how AI can be useful for writers, novel writers to become oh, creative. Yes. And this kind of article was saying that large language models can help novel writers to become more creative in the sense that they can achieve a better quality of their creation, plot twists, quality of the narration, the storytelling, not the the, the journey of the hero, well-crafted. But at the same time, if you're going to use only AI, you're going to decrease the novelty of your pro of your uh, project. So you can become, mm, we can say many people can become uh, or can generate quality content, but at the same time, this content is going to be more standardized, more uniform, instead of being, being something original. This is the same for education. Education should be quality, but should also consider the uniqueness of everyone. So mm -hmm. AI can be useful for the quality, we can say for the redistribution accessibility to quality, but still the human experience can be fundamental to make sense of the uniqueness of everybody. What do you think, Oliver? Yeah, I guess we, we've kind of touched a lot of times on the same kind of um, idea, uh, starting from the very beginning of the, the podcast, in the sense that we've kind of, we're kind of saying, I think all of us in different ways, that 
it's about how we use these tools wisely rather than just kind of you know um brute forcing our way into things uh and so i think really it's like it's all about balance isn't it it's about balance and and probably in in a situation like in a clinical situation one of the key values isn't so much the just the technology that you create it's about training um the clinicians and the patients not just to use the technology correctly but to have the correct strategy for implementing it within their uh hospital or whatever it is you know they need to know how is that best used because you you know it's not just about i give you this and then you decide what to make of it it's that you need to explain what the best use is for this which is uh you know when you were mentioning valentina about um about uh how to redistribute uh resources time resources I i'm not sure that all uh, doctors or therapists or whatever would probably use that so there's value also to be had in explaining this and in mentoring people uh with regards to to resource distribution when you're talking about ai and xr uh that's that's my idea at least yeah so what do you see the future of digital health for example what what, what what's the trend or what do you foresee because uh, I can tell you that recently I saw a startup that is very ambitious. It's pretty much a, a small box or like a small room made of iron and uh, it claimed to be the future of hospital. So there's no human inside. You just get in and there will be a, a series of like, a, I, I think probably robot or some robot arms will let you get through all the process and you you will finish the, for example, health check, or you will finish maybe in the future, the, the robot will uh, do the surgery for you automatically. So what do you see these types of uh, the future of like a digital health or even um, those types of like a uh, uh, robot arms uh, doing surgery for you? Because uh, for example, like a lot of people still need like a human to, calm you down right so what do you see these types of like sci-fi types of um, um, technology will kind of take over the entire thing you just go into the box and you finish everything and once you exit or you you, you see like there's something that human uh, need to be there you want to go <laughs> <laughs> okay let's go so um, in my opinion there are two sides of the future on one side, there is the technology advancement. As you say, Dominic, many technology advancements. And honestly, one of the most useful, in my opinion, is the convergence between AI and XR, for example, but not because of virtual humans, not necessarily for the application that we said before, but for the broad problem that we recognize, that every patient is unique. So AI can be extremely useful to potentially make sense of the data that XR collects and customize the final experience to be suitable to target the specific needs of the specific person. This is a dream uh, because it would be amazing to really provide one content that iterates across the population. And this can potentially be made through AI. Uh, but on the other side, we should never forget that whatever is the advancement of the technology, the technology should really fit in the health system. And the health system, until it will be not an interoperable ecosystem, until there will be not the good level of awareness and training of the health practitioners when it comes for digital skills, until we will not he have a regulatory, a clear regulatory framework for these technologies, all of these nice advancements will not work in the real world. This is my, my personal take because we enter in many hospitals, we have so many technologies today, but in the end of the story, the digital transformation is a very human thing. And if humans are not ready to transform through the digital technologies, you can have even the UFOs, but still people will say, no, I'm against technology. I don't want to play with kind of this kind of things. So it's a, it should be a human focused digital transformation. And there is a, a, still a lot of steps to be done in the direction. What do you think, Oliver? I think you're kind of saying the same thing that I think. Um, my, I was going to say it much more bluntly uh, and just say that I think that by the time uh 
an android, let's say, is capable of, of treating you on its own, by that time, we will all be cyborgs anyway. Uh, and we will all be fully integrated and we won't need androids anymore. So I don't think that's going to be the path. I think we're going to make a lot of mistakes, probably. We're gonna, there's going to be a lot of cases of, and there already are, of healthcare systems that try to apply technology to make money rather than to focus on you know, actually improving healthcare. Uh, this is the case in many places um, with the technologies we have now, right? Uh, but eventually, hopefully, um, you know, we'll reach a balance where we have such good technology and, and still good, uh, good, also good learning strategies and technology that helps us to learn well enough that it becomes easier to learn and be effective. So, you know, we can't, we're not allowed to make mistakes so easily, or rather we are allowed to make mistakes to learn, but it no longer really matters. And you can see this probably with cars, right? You know, cars are now, there are less accidents because the car itself prevents lots of problems. So, you know, it, it's going to get better, but um, I don't think that now is the time when we, I would imagine, uh, you know, an Android replacing a doctor, absolutely not. Um, I think that this is marketing, basically, and it's kind of a bit fake, to be honest. Yeah, because uh, if you see right now in Silicon Valley, uh, right now is that how can AI get out of a 2D computer screen and be physically uh, be with us and be a human form? and do things that we don't want to do. Because you see like right now, there are a lot of tech layoff, right? You can see a lot of engineer, they create something and they later on, they just got laid off on there <laughs> because they create something to automate uh, their task. So what do you see, for example, like uh, if later on, we don't need so many doctors, we don't need so many nurses, just because there are a lot of things being automated or something, then well, what do you see those? Like I can see, the labor needs less and less and the net labor uh, costs more and more. What, what do you see these types of things? Because, I mean, I'm in Silicon Valley and uh, every time when there is a layoff, it's always around <laughs> around my area. Uh, I don't know whether it's in Italy like that obvious, but for me, I just start realize like, wow, maybe the world doesn't need so many labors. And I even heard like some investor, they said that they can envision in the future, there will be under five people uh, create um, $1 billion value startup because uh, AI can really help kind of like uh, automate a lot of tasks and make labor's expert advice almost nearly free. So um, if you are trading your time in exchange for salary, that types of things, AI will slowly kind of like just if you only provide the skills. AI will slowly uh, kind of like uh, take it over. But uh, if you are uh, more like, oh, I am the product owner and I'm creating the value, I'm inventing a product, then AI really helps you to save your cost. So that's why a lot of like uh, investors were very excited. They think, oh, everybody now, since you know every company doesn't need so many people, uh, there will be a lot of human or uh, people released and they will create more diverse products for them to invest or like a very niche area for human or for entrepreneur to jump in and to um, kind of bridge the gap and to work with different types of uh, subject matter experts to create a very niche product. What, what do you see these types of trend? But this is an absolutely complex topic, really, really complex <laughs> uh, because it intercepts so many fields. Mm -hmm. Uh, just a perspective, just a short-term perspective. Uh, uh, the risk is to think that the goal is to have more freedom. And this is exactly the promise that was uh, delivered to people always with technology. You know, technology is going to make us more free, more free, more free, more free. And we are now exactly the opposite. We are working more. We are using the, the, the final... The final goal should not be how much free are we are we going to be, but how we are going to use this freedom. This is more critical for the society. Um, this is on a we can say social, cultural, and historical point of view. Uh, on the other side, um, the the job transition is critical today. is very challenging because of this uh, hyper automation at scale is generating a lot of layoffs. 
and many companies are struggling with that. Uh, probably in the short term, the winning strategy is a strategic reskilling. So all of the people that you are going to fire, because we should remember that just because you can work with less, less people probably are going to fire a lot of people. Uh, and this is a critical problem because they are not going to, to have money from other sources in the short term. So many companies are working on strategic reskilling, how to reposition those people in new uh, roles, in new skills. Of course, this is challenging because this requires investments and this requires a lot of, um, a lot of, we can say, um, time and cost that some companies don't know exactly how to manage. It's, uh, it's quite critical. Uh, it's, it's a very complex problem. I'm curious also, what is the take of Oliver? Yeah, immensely complex because first of all, we would need to establish, you know, what the actual cost of AI will be in the future as it gets more powerful in terms of even just electricity. So, you know, there's an economical thing and I'm not honestly qualified to even have any kind of idea of how that's going to be in the future. I don't think many people are, to be honest. Um, so, you know, you've got the ecological and, econo and therefore economical uh, cost. You have the fact that, you know, either you reskill people and if you reskill people, it's because you need to reskill them. So that means that you have uh, other jobs. So you're kind of increasing the quality of what you're producing. And that's fine, which is what we've always done. If you're not, then you have people with without money, a lot of people without money. And then who are you selling the products to in the first place? Uh, so and that means that we go into a society where it's structural for people not to work, kind of like Star Trek or something. Right. Um, but I somehow I don't think that's going to be the way it goes. <laughs> Um, so I don't know, honestly, I think it's very difficult to, to foresee. I think in the short term, the, the fact that people are going to re be replaced at least in part is, is it's already happening in some fields, but I don't think, uh, most doctors or clinicians will be because most of them simply aren't replaceable. Uh, there are areas where they can be replaceable. Some of their activities can be replaceable. Let me give the example, uh, I'm talking more about AI. I think we are talking mainly about AI now, right? Uh, but um, if you're talking about uh, screening, then melanoma is an obvious one. Uh, this is already much more effective done with AI systems or automized systems than uh, with just with a doctor looking at the mold. So uh, clearly that's going to change, but that's still, you still need the doctor to be, to, you know, to validate and to make clinical decisions. That's not going to be fast. I mean, at least it isn't going to be in Europe. Uh, I don't know. The US might have a completely different take because there may be a less stringent approach to uh, a certain, you know, to the, the kind of way you uh, think about healthcare. But certainly in Europe, I can't see this happening in the short term. Then again, we have a war going on and, you know, <laughs> everything's a bit... <laughs> a bit um, uncertain but in general i would say that you know i would see other jobs being replaced far far before before medical uh, jobs in general yeah i can tell you that uh, for example like i wrote a book and then before um i would say at the beginning of the year i was about to read my entire book as an audio book but later on when i read probably one third of my book i find out there's a button on the Amazon, like the author page, uh, the back end. I just need to click that one. It will automatically translate or um, add voiceover to my uh, digital uh, book. And uh, I was shocked because before, if you want to publish a, a, a book that is audio book from your writing, from your uh, kind of submission, um, you might need to partner with uh, the voice over actors, which might cost three to $5,000 and three months. But when I uh, click that button, probably within probably less than a day, it's finished and it's ready for you to review. I can kind of like a, a change, uh, change the, the voice and I can uh, edit the script and change the, the, the reading and I can even correct the pronunciation. So 
Yeah, and it's reading much better than me because I mean, I have accent and sometimes I don't really know something how to read it. I have to uh, train myself and it's doing much better than me. And the quality is probably, I would say B plus. It's not the best, but it's, um, yeah, bearable. It's, it's kind of like a good, better than me. So uh, I can see, for example, voice actor, right? Um, it's the best one probably still can uh, do something, but the, 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 the per, like for me, I don't have that much budget. So I just click the button and it's done. And also graphic designer. And if you see uh, recently Figma, right? Of uh, Ficom, uh, pretty much you can just type what you want, what, what app you want and it just generate all the UI for you. So yeah, so I can see this types of like my, um, I, I can see like a graphic design. A lot of people just say, wow, uh, how can let everybody start transferring to something and start escaping, <laughs> uh, going to different fields. So that's why, yeah. And also that's why I started this podcast because I think it's better to ask people outside of this kind of development, software development field, and see if there's any opportunities for, for our audience, who is majority of UX UI designer and uh, Unity developers to find other, like a, like your partnership, right? Or like a, your collaboration and also Oliver yourself is, it, it, you've already mingled those two. So you, you can very clear to see how you can utilize one part of your skill to help another uh, field. So I think this is like amazing. Yeah, so um, uh, do you have any last thing you want to mention uh, before the podcast end? Any insight, any thought about XR, AI, and uh, digital health? Valentino, you want to say something? Okay, I'll, I'm just going to say I can confirm that translation and voiceover is something that is going to go down the drain because I, I do both still and I'm doing it less and less. And I wouldn't invest in that if I was, uh, you know, choosing a job right now because it's either you're kind of the best or right up there or eventually a lot of people are going to just choose that. Um, uh, yeah, last things to mention, I guess, would just be that, um, that uh, probably... I, I think just something that's dear to my heart, which is that when you uh working with patients, um, you know, a lot of people who aren't from healthcare, they tend to kind of maybe approach clinical. Uh, I see this a lot when we collaborate with uh, engineers or people uh, in, in the places where I work. Um, there is a kind of an idea that you can kind of engineer, have an engineering approach to people. Um, and although I kind of appreciate that in some way that they're trying to find solutions, uh, but you can't, it's not the same thing. Like software isn't people yet, at least. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, it's one of the things I find comforting about software is you can kind of predict what's going to happen and test it. You can't do that with people uh, because everything you do has an effect and you don't know what it was. You don't necessarily know if it was you or if it was chance or if it was them. You have no idea. So you never really know. Uh, they're very variable, and so it requires a different approach, a very human approach, and that mustn't be forgotten when you're developing. So you have to develop tools, but it should always be secondary to the human uh, approach with the patient. That's all. Um, and that doesn't mean like a crash course in empathy, which is a bit pretty dumb anyway, but it means uh, really trying to you know listen to them and see what their experience is. That's all, really. I really love that we are so synchronized because I wanted to say something similar that whatever is the technology that you are going to use, even the most advanced one, especially when it comes for healthcare, go as close as possible to patients. You really need uh, to understand that you are managing real needs, uh, real vulnerabilities, uh, real Okay, real vulnerabilities, real um, real needs, real conditions. Uh, you need to solve their problems, not the problems of the software, not the problems of the technology. So the real challenge is not if you're going to use Vision Pro, for example, or MetaQuest 3. The question is, who is going to use your solution? Why you want to provide a solution to them and how you can solve the problem? Then comes the solution, we can say the tool. 
the tool is the result of the problem that you identified and the solution that you, we can say, designed and developed in the meantime. Technology comes after. It's a tool that bridges solutions with, with problems. But first of all, try to empathize with patients, try to understand how they reason. Uh, this is even more important than sometimes discussing with physicians or nurses because they see the patients from a slightly different perspective. But if you talk with patients, they know, they know their feelings, they're complex, they know their subjective needs. Uh, we really started our discussion talking about pain management and stress management. And in so many hospitals, the subjective needs of patients are not exactly the priority. And this is the big challenge because maybe you can deliver a sedative, but still the patients are experiencing a dramatic moment in the hospital and they don't have all of the tools that can support them. So what you want to do is really talk with patients, understand how they feel, what they think, how to describe their life, and then you can craft the solution around this kind of information. And of course, talk also with physicians and nurses and so on. So you can have a real complex 360 degree vision of the of the setting. Wow. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think this is like a very good like a ending because I think at the end, all the technology is serving uh, people, right? And if we are, for example, like me, I'm like very techy savvy. And every time when I talk about uh, a software or a kind of like a, an app, I always want to dive into like the technology part, right? So uh, just like you said that, go back to the patient. Uh, who will use your technology and who will use your solution and what types of problem you are trying to solve and technology comes later. So uh, I think the two of you guys, that's why you work so well together because you have the same kind of like uh, uh, visions uh, for the future of digital health. And also before we talk a lot about like AI thing, but just like Oliver said that, maybe by the time when everything automated by uh, Android and we become cyber. So there's no difference because when they think of something, uh, we have some chips. So I, I personally think AI is the collateral, uh, like the collective intelligence of entire humanity. So pretty much if you have a chips or you, if you uh, integrate with AI very closely, it's pretty much you are a uh, walking computer or working walking cyborg as well because you carry all the entire humanity uh, knowledge inside you and you can uh, integrate your personal thing and later on uh, become like a, I would say like a cyborg you you will be really knowledgeable so um, the you. android will under you <laughs> Cool. Yeah. Thank you so much for uh, taking the um, uh, interview. And that's it for this episode. Thank you for listening. We release episodes weekly. If you enjoy this conversation, check out our other episodes on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or YouTube. Support us by giving us a follow and a five-star rating or subscribe to our channel and give this video a like. Thank you so much and see you next time. Thanks a lot, Dominic.